Good evening, I'm Ryan Bonazzo. And I'm Catalina Gillies. A member of the Thunder Bay Police Services Board is posting harsh criticism on social media about her own board and police chief, Sylvie Ha. George Ann Morriso is a former chair of the police board, and she remains a sitting member despite filing a human rights complaint against Hoth and police board officials last month. Morriso posted on Facebook on Friday saying there is a lack of leadership, oversight, accountability, and transparency. She also makes claims about tactics used to discredit and silence officers as well as herself. The post is in response to a separate human rights complaint filed recently by a retired police officer against the force. Morriso claims that officer was forced to retire for doing what's right. Morriso was not available for an interview today. Police Board Chair Kristen Oliver declined to comment, citing a conflict of interest. Police Board Secretary John Hannum and Mayor Bill Morrow, who sits on the Police Board, have also declined to comment on Morriso's social media posts. There's been a spike in COVID-19 cases in the Thunder Bay District over the weekend, driving the active case count to its highest level in more than five months. The health unit is reporting 17 new infections today. 14 of those come from the Thunder Bay area. Three others are in First Nation communities. 13 of the cases are a result of close contact. One is related to travel outside of northwestern Ontario, and three exposure sources are still unknown at this time. There are now 30 active cases across the TBDHU. That's the most since June 17th. Over in the Northwestern Health Unit, there are nine new cases. Eight come from the Kenora area, while the other is in the Rainy River District. There are now 14 active cases in the NWHU's catchment area. Ontario parents who want to have their younger children vaccinated against COVID-19 can book an appointment starting tomorrow. The province is opening up vaccine bookings to the estimated 1 million children between the ages of 5 and 11 who are now eligible for the Pfizer shot. Colin DeMello has details. Millions of doses of the Pfizer vaccine touched down in Hamilton over the weekend, now destined for vaccine clinics across Ontario. The shipment for today is about a little over 400,000 and then there's a shipment of a little over 600,000 coming in. Some goes to public health units, some goes to primary care, some will go to pharmacies, of course. The Ford government says the provincial vaccine booking portal will open tomorrow morning for children between the ages of 5 and 11, with the first dose is set to be administered on Thursday. And the government says any child born in 2016 will be eligible right away. So not, not birthday, but your birth year, uh, you qualify. And on the other end, the 12-year-olds, um, for the second shot, when we get to the uh, eight weeks, um, if you have hit uh, 12 years old at that point, then you will, then you will get an adult dose for your second uh, shot. In Peel Region, one of the hardest hit areas for COVID-19, children are being treated as small superheroes. Children have really been superheroes throughout this. They've had to uh, navigate different ways of learning and navigate different ways of uh, living. Um, and uh, really, this is about uh, trying to make the experience as comfortable as possible so that kids can have uh, confidence uh, to go back to just being kids, really. But high demand could also drive up the number of parents looking to access the website tomorrow, leading to questions over why the province wasn't proactive. In other provinces, the systems were already in, already in place for parents to pre-register for their children. In British Columbia, for example, 75,000 kids are already signed up for the vaccine. Why has Ontario not been able to do what other provinces have done? One of the issues is, of course, you, can, you can't make bookings until you know exactly when it's going to be approved and exactly when the vaccines are going to be ready. So as of tomorrow, people will be able to make the appointments for their children. The province says some public health units will also offer pop-up or walk-in clinics for children. An investigation is underway over concerns that Ontario's vaccine booking system may have been hacked. Premier Doug Ford says he's been fully briefed on the situation. So I talked to the Premier of Newfoundland and they hacked, as you know, hacked into the health system there. I've had a conversation with my chief of staff, with the uh, principal secretary and secretary of cabinet, and uh, they have all hands on deck on all our ministries, especially our Ministry of Health. And I'm, I'm confident with, uh, with the group that we have down there. Ford says the OPP is confident it will get to the bottom of what happened, 
if anything. Thunder Bay Fire Rescue crews responded to a call at 4.30 this morning after a fire broke out inside the Dawson Street Apartments. Heavy smoke and flames were coming out of a ground floor window when the firefighters arrived on scene. Along with extinguishing the fire, the crews also evacuated the building's other tenants. There were three adults and a pet dog in the apartment unit when the fire broke out. The occupants were aided by firefighters on scene and then transported to the hospital. They've all now been treated and released. The fire damage is considered extensive and the scorched contents of the apartment have to be removed. No word yet on the cause of the fire. Officials with Thunder Bay Fire Rescue want to remind the public that working smoke alarms save lives. Thunder Bay police have seized a loaded handgun and drugs stemmed from a suspected home takeover. Officers were dispatched last night to a home in the 200 block of Windsor Street. Six people were arrested on scene, three from the Thunder Bay area. The other three from the Toronto area, including a 16-year-old. Police have charged each of them with cocaine trafficking, being unlawfully in a dwelling, and possession of cash obtained from crime. The youth is also being charged with possession of a firearm with a tampered serial number. A request to improve safety at social services buildings, including the site of a recent murder, headlines tonight's Thunder Bay City Council agenda. And a list of outside proposals to build a multi-use indoor turf facility is being kept under wraps by the city. Councillors have received a report on the eight submissions. The call for expressions of interest allowed proposals for things like a soccer dome or bubble and different sites aside from Chapels Park. No decision will be made as the city awaits word on a $22 million federal funding request for the original indoor turf project. In other business, Westport Councillor Kristen Oliver wants the city to advocate for stricter eviction practices. This after concerns from tenants at Spence Court where a man was murdered earlier this month. I've been discussing uh, the concerns that a lot of the residents in Spence Court are experiencing and the fear that they have, recognizing that a lot of these people have lived in this complex for decades. And over the course of the last few years, they're seeing um, substantial increases in some, some criminal activity and violent behavior. Also tonight, Council will hear back from the City's Bylaw Department on ways to control the high number of shopping carts that are abandoned throughout the City. The Gull Bay First Nation has elected its new band Council, and for the eighth time in the last 20 years, Wilfred King has been voted in as Chief to serve the community for another four years. Gull Bay is located on Highway 527, about two hours north of Thunder Bay, but many band members live here in the City. Wilfred King defeated five challengers. He received 321 votes, about twice as many as second place finisher Brian King. Galbay had delayed the election by a year due to the pandemic. The re-elected chief says his priorities include moving land claim settlement, completing the water treatment facility, and building community infrastructure. Galbay First Nation, you know, the people had faith in my leadership and uh, the results of what I've done in the last 20 years speak for themselves. And I want to, you know, thank the membership for putting trust in my leadership once again. Ten band councillors were also elected to serve Galbay for the next four years. The number of people struggling to afford food continues to increase in the city during the pandemic. So to help fill the void, the RFDA and 211 North have partnered to ensure that no one goes hungry this Christmas by providing holiday hampers to those who qualify. Danielle Bain has more. December can be financially difficult for anyone, especially those relying on social assistance. That's why the Regional Food Bank and 211 North have partnered to provide holiday food hampers on top of the regular hampers they hand out every two weeks. President of the RFDA, June Gaw, thinks this campaign is one of the most impactful they do all year. It is really important that we um, help, help these people get through Christmas. Christmas can be a very stressful time for everyone. And if at least they don't have to worry about having extra food on hand, that's one less stressful item to deal with. Gaw says the need for these holiday hampers is constant year over year, but the pandemic seems to have escalated the demand. The numbers are certainly going to be increasing. We've noticed a huge increase in our regular food bank uh, clientele, the numbers, so I think that the hampers this year are going to increase in numbers as well. 
Those requiring certain foods based on dietary restrictions or religious reasons can still receive appropriate items in their hampers. Our FDA Community Services Manager Brendan Carlin says they've started receiving specialty items from Feed Ontario. We're getting better at offering those options to people who have those those needs. Um, so oftentimes, I know for our delivery program, people will call 211 and register and they'll say they have those needs and then we make sure that they get a hamper with those types of items in there. And that goes for dietary restrictions of any kind, really. Um, so is, is our system perfect for those types of foods? Not yet, but we're working on it for sure. Those in need can register with 211 from now until December 13th. Once you register, you'll be provided with a pickup location close to you and you can grab your hamper December 16th or 17th. The RFDA hopes to hand out 1,500 hampers to help ease some of that holiday burden. Danielle Bain, TBT News. A Thunder Bay family received quite a surprise while renovating their home on East Christina Street. A wedding book from 1945 was found lodged inside one of the walls. And now thanks to the Facebook page Thunder Bay Memories, the owner, 96-year-old Do Dolly Carlson, has been found in Kelowna, B.C. Alex Flood has a story. Having a story to your home and knowing who built it, knowing how long they were here, they raised family here. And the Wolfram family was surprised to learn they had been living inside an unintended time capsule, uncovering a 76-year-old wedding book after doing renovations on the walls of their home. Melanie Wolfram, the daughter-in-law of the couple who discovered the book, shared the findings on the Thunder Bay Memories Facebook page, and within minutes, Dolly Carlson was contacted. First thing I heard about it was uh, Memories of Thunder Bay from my daughter. Uh, someone had contacted her that they had found this um, marriage certificate and uh, the guest list. I don't know what else is there in the walls. Isn't that something, eh? Why the wedding documents were lodged inside of the wall was a question left unanswered for decades until now. Doug, the nephew, had talked to Dolly and she had no idea. She had no idea why it would be in the wall, why he put it in there, so that was a surprise. But then he t reached out to his cousin Lois, which was their daughter, and she said that she found out that Dad liked to hide things in the walls. So there could be other important things in there. So we're not going to be too quick to patch the walls up. We take a look and poke around. Dolly was married to her husband, Alf, for 55 years, 46 of those spent inside the East Christina home, and she's thrilled to be reunited with this long-lost piece of family history. Couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it because I never missed it all these years. I had no reason. I thought it was uh, in my safety deposit box. I'd like to thank them very much because usually if somebody finds something old like that, they just uh, toss it away, you know, but it was very nice of her. Dolly wanted to say that she's still alive and kicking at 96 and a half years old and they had a lot of love and not a lot of money and they lived a great life. So that was important to her. Alex Flood, TBT News. What a great story. Well, after missing last year's visit, Santa Claus is back at Intercity Shopping Centre this holiday season. The jolly old elf made his return this weekend, spreading joy and making a list of gift requests. Mitchell Ringos has more. Last year, the mall cancelled all public events due to COVID-19. But this year opened their doors once again to Santa Claus with a few modifications. This year's Santa Magic Holiday Experience had a new plexiglass wall in between Santa and the kids. Even with the barrier, the Christmas event had plenty of families stopping by to get their pictures taken with the man himself all the way from the North Pole. Inner City Shopping Centre Marketing Manager Shannon Young says even though the kids couldn't sit on Santa's lap, they were still very excited. You know what, we're going to keep it around the plexiglass barrier for just to see what happens, but hopefully, cross our fingers, next year we can have it uh, back to normal. And for most kids, meeting Santa every year at the mall is a dream, and last year we're missing out on the beloved annual holiday event, which Young says was nice to finally have back. I think they've been waiting. They're like, we're Santa, we're Santa. We get, we get emails, we get kids coming up to us asking us that, and it's great that he's back and they can see him. They're just, they're happy. Santa will be available for book visits at the mall from 11 in the morning to just before 7 at night, all the way until December 24th. 
With Mr. Claus and his helpers finally back in Thunder Bay, we asked some kids at the mall what kind of gifts they asked for. I wanted a Mocha so spy though. I want a Godzilla toy for Christmas. A LOL doll? Anything else? No. I would like a Nintendo Switch, and what the holiday means to me is it means family, friends, and getting together in the birth of Jesus. I like the holidays because it's the birth of our Lord. Thank you very much. And Santa's home away from home here at Inner City Shopping Center will be getting a touch-up next year with a brand new gingerbread house and accessories. Mitchell Ringo's TBT News. Great to see Santa back. Local skiers and snowboarders will soon be able to get back out on the slopes with the winter temperatures now upon us. Loch Lomond Ski Area has started making snow in preparation for the new season. The ski hill began making snow last night and the snow guns were running again today. The process of building up a good snow base typically takes upward of six weeks. But with the current conditions ideal for snowmaking, the slopes could be up and running sooner. Loch Lomond General Manager Jason Gary says as long as Mother Nature continues to cooperate, the ski hill will soon be ready to welcome back locals to the slopes. Cold weather in order for us to have our basic ski runs open. Um, but yeah, if we get any help from Mother Nature, everything else is ready to go. All of our lifts are ready to run, you know, all of the inside operations are ready to go, all of our staff are hired and trained. So, you know, as far as that goes, we're all just in a holding pattern now waiting, waiting for weather. While Gary wouldn't commit to an exact date for when the slopes could be open, he says they hope